our next speaker will touch on uh, one of the TAG Five Essentials for Healthy Adolescents, uh, that's access to high-quality, teen-friendly health care. <clears throat> Dr. Mara Decker is Director of the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Evaluation at the University of California, San Francisco's Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies and the Bixby Center for Global Reproductive Health. She joins us today to share her recent research on strategies to promote adolescent sexual health, including improving access to both sexual and reproductive health services. Dr. Decker? Thank you so much. It's a privilege and a pleasure to be a part of this webinar. Ms. Kepler provided a great overview to adolescent health. And today, I'm going to be focusing specifically on strategies to increase access to sexual health services. We're going to be looking at three particular strategies, building relationships between providers and adolescents, promoting youth-friendly services, and offering services in alternative settings. First, however, let's briefly put adolescent sexual and reproductive health in context. Adolescent health has come a long way since the 1990s, back when I was a teenager. While we are focusing today on the remarkable decline in teen birth rates from almost 60 births per 1,000 females in 1990 to less than half of that rate today, teens also have significantly reduced their rates of smoking and drinking while increasing their use of effective contraceptive methods and delaying the age they first have sex. For example, in 1990, about a third of teens reported drinking five or more drinks in a row, while that has fallen to about 20% today and cigarette use also has been cut in half. While these rates vary, these improvements are seen in virtually every racial and ethnic group and in most parts of the United States. This is a really important point. When given the information and opportunity to make responsible decisions, the vast majority of adolescents today do. Much of the great decline in teen births in recent years has been attributed to gains in adolescents' use of more effective contraceptive methods, as well as delaying their age at first sex and reducing their sexual activity. Increasing access to contraception, as well as increasing access to other sexual health services, has been an important and successful public health strategy for reducing the negative consequences of risky sexual behaviors. Although the percent of teens using long-acting reversible contraceptive methods, such as the IUD and the implant, has increased, the numbers are still quite small, and there are opportunities to build on these positive trends and continue the recent declines in adolescent pregnancy. For example, the Contraceptive Choice Project in St. Louis showed significantly reduced rates of pregnancy, birth, and abortion through the provision of free contraception and education regarding long-acting methods for adolescents. We'll hear more about a similar project in my home state of Colorado later in this webinar. However, many adolescents still struggle to access quality sexual and reproductive health services and they need, that they need in order to protect themselves from risks. Numer numerous barriers exist, including, sorry, including a lack of awareness of available services, concerns about insurance eligibility, or concerns about out-of-pocket costs if adolescents do not have access to subsidized services, limited access to transportation, inconvenient service hours, embarrassment, and concerns about their confidentiality. We're going to examine three strategies to overcome these barriers. The first is building relationships between providers and adolescents. Healthcare providers are an important source of sexual health information, counseling, and services for adolescents. The private provider relationship is critical to creating a positive and satisfying visit that results in improved use of contraception. Adolescents can be hesitant to ask about sexual health issues, and too often providers do not initiate these conversations due to personal discomfort, concerns about legal or ethical issues, or limited time. The more that clinicians raise topics related to sex, sexuality, and violence during confidential health care visits, the greater the likelihood that adolescents will share personal information regarding their need for contraceptive care and other support. Assuring confidential services also contributes to greater engagement and continuity of care. Clinical practice guidelines can help providers understand their role in promoting adolescent sexual health but providers may not follow them due to a lack of familiarity or uncertainty with how to implement guidelines and practice. 
among other reasons. In addition, these guidelines have notable gaps. For example, they often do not address the role of providers in helping to screen and refer for additional health issues that impact reproductive health and patient compliance, such as mental health and substance use, or how to better integrate STI screening and treatment as part of the reproductive health visit. Efforts are needed to consolidate evidence-based guidelines, clarify their purpose to providers, and promote their use in clinical practice. Provider training and dissemination of information also can improve attitudes and practices. The attitudes of providers can have an impact on adolescents' contraceptive choice and, con con and continuation. For example, although long-acting reversible contraceptive methods are recommended as a first-line choice for adolescents, providers are less likely to recommend that to adolescents in comparison to older clients. Providers may view LARC as inappropriate for adolescents due to the perceived physiological constraints, costs, or the perceptions that adolescents will discontinue the use prematurely. Similarly, some providers assume pelvic exams are required in advance of contraceptive provision or that return visits are required for continued receipt or refills of contraceptives. Provider attitudes toward LARC for adolescents can be improved by disseminating evidence for LARC, dispelling misconceptions, and training providers on insertion techniques. As we mentioned in the previous presentation, Promoting youth-friendly health service is a critical component of this. The World Health Organization defines youth-friendly services as accessible, appropriate, acceptable, equitable, and effective. Services should be provided to improve access, utilization, and increased returns to health facilities among adolescents. Particularly important strategies include protecting privacy and confidentiality and training all the staff from the reception to the clinician to work with adolescents. This includes the importance of a respectful and non-judgmental approach. In addition, affordable or free services and providing convenient opening hours and locations helps to increase accessibility. For example, California's Family Planning Access Care and Treatment Program offers a one-stop shop model linking the availability and the ability to enroll adolescent clients at the point of service, confidentiality protocols, removal of cost barriers, culturally sensitive services, and comprehensive reproductive health services for both males and females. A referral system to youth-friendly health services from schools, detention facilities, and other services can ensure youth receive appropriate care. A number of studies have shown youth-friendly interventions can improve awareness, access, and use of reproductive health services, and increase follow-up returns. A national survey of publicly funded family planning facilities found that facilities with staff trained in youth-friendly services had increased rates of discussions about contraceptives and increased the provision of contraceptives, including LARC, to adolescent clients in comparison to non-youth-friendly sites. Adolescents with the greater, greatest barriers to accessing health services in formal health facilities are often those in greatest need and with the highest risk. They may be better served through alternative or out-of-facility health services, including web or internet-based services, school-based health centers, mobile clinics, and street-based outreach. Juvenile justice facilities also can provide reproductive health information and services. There is strong evidence supporting that out-of-facility services can be feasible, acceptable, and effective when providing reproductive health services. For example, a statewide program in Louisiana used street outreach workers to deliver education and distributed over a half a million, dollar, a half a million condoms over a two-year period to neighborhoods with youth at high risk for adolescent pregnancy. This program significantly increased the proportion of youth reporting condom use at last sex in comparison to neighborhoods without the intervention. There is little question of the prominent role that media and technology play in the lives of today's adolescents. A recent national survey found that the vast majority of adolescents have gone online to seek health information, whether to research a school assignment, learn to take care of their health, check symptoms, or find information for friends and family. However, there is limited evidence as to the impact these online resources have on reproductive health information and access. A key question for the future will be how to unite the power of media and technology with the known successes of in-person support and services to increase access to health care. In California, 
A web-based condom access project allows youth aged 12 to 19 years old to find teen-friendly locations where condoms are available for free or confidentially request that condoms be sent to them by mail if they live in counties with high STI rates. The National Campaign's Bedsider incorporates a website, social media, mobile technologies, and games that allow young women to compare methods of contraception, find nearby health centers, and sign up for birth control or appointment reminders sent by email or text. Young women who learned about Bedsider were less likely to have unprotected sex and more likely to use an effective contraceptive method compared to similar women in a control group. Note the concerns about privacy seem to hamper teens' interest in more interactive interventions via social media. Youth residing in juvenile justice facilities consistently report high rates of sexual risk behaviors, including the number of partners, inconsistent use of condoms, and early sexual debut. A study in Texas detention centers found that over 30% had already been or gotten someone pregnant. They also reported higher rates of sexual risk behaviors, including having sex with multiple partners and exchanging sex for money or drugs. Furthermore, many youth in detention centers have mental health issues, often co-occurring with substance abuse. For many youth, the juvenile justice system presents a unique opportunity to test, treat, educate, and connect high-risk youth to healthcare services and community, other community resources. SHARP, a sex education program that includes motivational interviewing, has shown positive outcomes in this setting and as has STI screening for young women. School-based health centers can be a key access point to expand exposure to reproductive health information, services, and counseling. Studies have shown school-based health centers can provide on-site reproductive health services and increase the use of contraception, reduce pregnancy, reduce repeat pregnancy rates, and decrease dropout rates and absenteeism of, the, of pregnant and parenting teens. While school-based health centers are an attractive option, there are fewer than 2,500 sites across the United States. In addition to school-based health centers, school-based sex education should provide information about available services in the community. Because many adolescents, as well as many adults, face significant barriers in reaching a healthcare provider, particularly in rural areas, and because oral contraceptives are widely regarded as safe, Reproductive health groups and medical associations increasingly say hormonal contraceptives such should be available without a prescription. Internationally, many countries allow oral contraceptives to be available over-the-counter. These global efforts provide evidence that over-the-counter accessibility meets safety criteria, improves access, and encourages contraceptive continuation in comparison to prescription-based requirements. A recent study found that 73% of female adolescents in the United States support over-the-counter access to oral contraceptives, with 61% stating that they would be interested in obtaining oral contraceptives this way. While oral contraceptives in the United States aren't available yet over-the-counter, beginning in 2016, people living in California and Oregon can obtain contraceptives from pharmacists without a doctor's prescription after completing a quick screening about their health and medical histories. While California's law has no age restriction, the Oregon law requires that teenagers under age 18 obtain their first contraceptive prescription from a doctor. This presentation hi highlighted just a few strategies to improve adolescent reproductive health by increasing access to services. Note, however, that adolescent health is greatly affected by the social, economic, cultural, and family context in which adolescents live. A socio-ecological perspective recognizes that adolescent well-being is contingent upon multiple aspects of the physical and social environment, as well as individual characteristics. The choices that adolescents make are strongly influenced by their own personal values, as well as the customs and values they see among their peers, family, and community. Parental communication is a vital piece of this adolescent development. In addition to increasing access to services, the issue of adolescent pregnancy must be addressed at multiple levels, from individual adolescents' knowledge and personal development to larger systemic issues, including healthcare policy 
and the broader community and development concerns, including job and educational opportunities for youth and safety. In summary, adolescents continue to face barriers when accessing sexual health services. However, effective strategies for improving quality access exist. We discussed three, improving communication of providers, providing youth-friendly services, and offering services in, youth, in alternative settings. I'd like to thank my colleagues at the University of California, San Francisco, for their help in preparing this presentation, particularly Claire Brindis, Amanda Mazur, and Nancy Burgliss. Thank you so much.